music. The words we have are the only words available to us. The words we know are the only tools available to us to interpret what's going on, to interpret what's being said, and to express your heart and your mind. Now, if you can interpret well and if you can't express well, you can imagine what a deterrent that is to the good life and the extra treasures, the extra feelings, awareness, riches, power, influence. So, it's very important to have a good vocabulary. So, I would ask you, one of the most important books in your library should be the dictionary. I've got a good question. How long do you want it to take to get good at what you do? You say, not very long? Then you've got to do it often. Do it often. Repetition starts the skill. Now, it also must be repetition with the objectivity of getting better because sometimes it's easy to be casual just about repetition and not get much better. How about the man who's been talking for 10 years, but he's making the same verbal errors he made 10 years ago? Or 10 years ago he said, I don't quite know how to put this, and 10 years later he's saying, I don't quite know how to put this. We say, hey, 10 years is too long not to know how to put it. We can give you 10 hours not to know how to put it. You can stretch our patience and take 10 days not to know how to put it, but we can't give you 10 years. 10 years is too long not to make enough progress in better language skill. So, repetition with purpose. The purpose is to grow and to change, to develop, to expand, to make progress. Emotions, feelings, phrases, sentences, paragraphs. It's very important now to be able to translate it, learning to say it well. Now, this is a whole subject in itself. This is worth a weekend of study. Let me just give you a short list of suggestions on learning to say it well. 1. Repetition. It just takes practice. I don't know any substitute for practice to learn any skill. You've just got to go through it again and again and again. My first attempt at lecturing, especially outside my own comfortable business circles, was pretty tough. Learning to say it well was a struggle for me. But I kept at it and kept at it, and now I've gotten better. I do one seminar called Challenge to Succeed. It's not four hours long, and I can do it without any notes. Every once in a while, a person comes and says, you lectured this evening for four hours without any notes. How can you do that? I said, it's very simple. I've done it a few thousand times. We call that simplicity. You just do it over and over and often. Next is vocabulary. Saying it well is proper choice of words. To build my early vocabulary, I used to put three or four words I didn't know on a card and put it up on the sun visor in my car. Back in those days, I traveled a lot by car. Sure enough, by the end of the day, I mastered two or three words in my vocabulary. Vocabulary is a way of seeing. One reason for vocabulary is to interpret what we see, to interpret what we hear. The vocabulary of the mind grapples with the words and the images that come to our mind. Now, if you've got a poor set of words and skills and tools with which to interpret, you can imagine the errors and the mistakes you'll make in judgment. And since vocabulary is a way of seeing, if you can't see well, you can imagine the errors you can make and how they compound as life unfolds. We do two things with vocabulary. We interpret and we express. Here are some other parts of sincerity. From the heart, with noble intent, wishing to bring value. That adds immeasurably to your ability to speak well, communicate well. There's no substitute for sincerity. I can forgive you for a mistake in judgment, but I can't forgive you for a mistake in intent. The key part of saying it well is brevity. Part of the key is to be brief. You can't linger too long. I've discovered in my lecturing and speaking around the world, you can't linger too long on any one point. I used to tell stories too long, too long. I get involved in a long, long story, and by the time I hit the punchline, people forgot how it started. Now, it doesn't make sense. Too long. Here's why brevity is important. The human attention span is short. You haven't got long to get it said before you lose your audience. Now, the best practice I know of here is practice on the kids because their attention span is really short. You talk to kids for 30 seconds, they say, how long is this going to take? Right? I mean, they're already bent out of shape, right? Looks like you're going to take forever to get to the point. Get it said. Sometimes we try to make up in words what we lack in self-confidence. So, part of the key to being brief is personal development, personal growth, 
personal awareness, understanding self-worth. You can use the economy of words, and this is a good position to be in, that what you are adds so much weight to what you say that you don't have to say very much. But brevity is a good point in saying it well. Now starts the power of what we say, intensity. Part of the strength of what we say is the words we choose. The greater part of the strength of what we say is the emotions that are loaded in the words. Here's what is power unmatched. Words loaded with emotion. There is no greater power. Words have an effect. But words loaded with emotion have an incredible effect. My words may reach you, but if I can't touch you with my spirit, if I can't touch you with my emotions, my feelings, my beliefs, then I probably haven't affected you very much. Real persuasion comes from putting you into what you say. But now here's part of the clue, and we call these extra refinement of leadership skills. Learning to measure your emotions. That's very important, to learn to measure your emotions. You don't need an atomic explosion for a minor point, enough but not too much. We call this understanding how to measure the flow of your emotions to cover a point, okay. But if it needs heavyweight stuff, you reach and get it. If it needs a milder approach, you learn how to measure it in milder, easier terms. But it's very important to measure your emotions, your feelings. Now, what do we mean by intensity and emotions? Here it is. All of your experiences and how they've affected you. That's the sum total of your emotional content. Where you've been and what you've heard and what you've seen and who you've met and this whole panorama of life experiences for you up until now and how you felt about all that. That we call the sum total of your emotions. Now, the key is to learn how to measure all that and put it in effective amounts into the words you choose. So, here's the key to effective communications. Well-chosen words loaded with well-measured emotions. Next is style, and there's all kinds of parts of style from body language and gestures to facial expressions and eyes and emotion. But style is very important. Here's part of the clue. It's not just the matter you cover, it's the manner in which you cover the matter. Style is important to attract someone's attention, to emphasize the point. Now, I've got a couple of good points here on style. Be a student of style, but don't just copy someone's style. Make sure that the study of style becomes distinctly you. But it is also important to be a student of style. How people speak well, be a student of that, and then borrow bits and pieces from people you admire and the way they can communicate and make sure that all of that, blended into you, becomes your own distinctive style. But style is very important. Now, there's a variety of styles, but it's important to study your own style and say, how am I coming across in style? Did I learn to emphasize more? Should I learn to be more emphatic? All these things concerning style. Read your audience. It's very important to read and to pick up the signals of what's happening with your audience. Now, when I first started lecturing outside my business circles, I had some problems here. My audience, I think, my early audiences, they all could have left halfway through and I'd have never known it. I was so intent on what I was saying that I was a bit unconscious of what was going on out there. Then I finally learned to look up, to watch, and see what's happening. We call this reading what's happening. Now, it's also just as important to read a person, to read a child. If you want to be effective, you've got to get the feedback. You've got to pick up the signals to know whether to be stronger or whether to ease off, whether to change story, change words, change language. All of this comes by a good ability to read your audience. So, let me give you some clues on reading. Number one is simply to listen. Part of reading is listening. You pick up a lot of clues as to what else to say, what all to say, by being a good listener. From early times, I think we've learned to be a good speaker. You've got to be a good listener. That's where you pick up the information, is to listen well, especially in a private conversation, a more informal conversation, good listening habits. That's part of reading too. You've got to read what you see. Part of it is just being conscious, right? Body language, reading what you see. Here's what we teach in leadership skills. Don't mistake courtesy for consent. In a polite society, we've learned sometimes to be courteous, but that doesn't mean we buy the story. With somebody being polite, smiling, and nodding, you've got to make sure you don't misread that and stop short of the full persuasion. Don't mistake kindness for acceptance. In a polite society, we've learned to be kind, but that doesn't mean we've accepted. 
So part of this is a little more subtle in reading in a polite society, whether or not somebody is buying your argument, if they're being persuaded by your presentation. So body language, picking up those signals. Now, here's the one that's probably the most effective, but it's probably the most elusive, reading the emotional signals. This is an area probably where the women have it over the men, picking up the emotional signals. I think men can learn these skills, but I think women have a lot of this automatically. But it's something we all have to learn. Emotional signals, picking up the signals of whether to change your language, be sharper, or to be softer, to go after a problem or to ease back and give it time to soak. Part of this is just picking up the feelings, picking up the emotions, being sensitive to the situation. This is not easy stuff. This is extra learning stuff, extra skills. But this is called summit learning for those extra measures of rewards that come from communicating by learning these extra skills. Very important to read your audience. How are you coming across? What is the effect? From a child to an auditorium full of people, reading, reading, practice the art every chance you get. Try to say it well. It's easy to be lazy in language all day and not practice the gift and the art. Then, when it comes time to make an important talk to a people, to a child, we're missing the words and missing the sharpness and missing the vocabulary simply because we lack the practice of doing it every day. If you want to get good at communication, you have to be aware of doing it every day as a practice session of getting better so that when the real important occasions arise, you will have the gift and you'll have the style. You'll have the sharpness and the clarity and the substance and the emotion. I have a key phrase for you. Actions are no substitute for words. Don't fail to say it. Now, we've heard the old expression. Words are no substitute for action. That's true. Talk, 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 never act. That's not good. But this also isn't good. Act, 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 and never talk. Here's the next part of a good presentation. It's what we call logic and reason. If you're trying to persuade a child, talk to a child, or talk to an audience, or if you're trying to talk to a customer, part of any presentation is the logical part, the facts and the figures, the numbers and the dimensions. And we won't linger too long here because here's my point on logic and reason. It's got to be brief. We need some facts, but only enough facts to start the decision-making process. You've got to beware not to cover too many facts. I'm sure we've all heard the expression. It's possible to talk somebody into buying, keep on talking, talk them out of buying. Here's where this problem usually occurs. Even if it's a child, you can talk a child into deciding. Then you keep on talking, talking, and then they undecide. We talk past, too much logic, too much reason. We need just enough logic and reason so that it starts to make sense, not so that you understand it all. How many facts do you need? About a half dozen. And if somebody makes the mistake of going beyond the half dozen, here's what they're going to do. Lose their audience. So, you've got to make sure you don't get into too wide range of facts and logic because here's why. Most decisions are made emotionally. We need just enough logic so that it makes sense, but we're going to do it probably out of emotion. So, the key is to be brief with logic, reasons, facts, because too much of anything is too much right at one time. In a wider range of teaching all of this, here's the reaction you want from identification. Me too. You just want the reaction for somebody to say, me too. I understand what that's like. I've been there. So part of it is trying to translate your experiences into words so that someone will identify with it and say, me too. Here's the reaction you don't want. So what? Now, it's easy if you're not careful to load your presentation with a lot of, so what's? Mr. Schoff, who only went to the 8th grade in school, he gave me the classic point ponder here when I was 25 years old, and it was put in such simple terms of never forgotten. Let me put it in those same terms for you. Here's what he said. Learn to express, not impress. That was so helpful for me because it's easy to engage in language just designed to impress instead of express. But Schoff said, if you want to touch somebody, learn to express. Sincerity from the heart, not impress. Impress builds a gulf, express builds a bridge. Identification, this is a whole wide subject in itself. The identification question. What will make me real to my audience? What will make me real to the child? Identification is building a bridge. If you're meeting somebody for the first time, simply getting acquainted, building a bridge, making contact. 
Here's one of the clues. Find something you have in common. That's where you start, something you have in common. Here's the clue to really affecting people. Start with where they are before you try to take them to where you want them to go. Meet people where they are. If somebody's hurting, you've got to meet in the hurt. If somebody's in trouble, you've got to start with the trouble. The key is to start where somebody is. If they're in trouble, you've got to start first of all talking trouble. So that when somebody is stricken in the heart and you've had this experience, maybe not as deeply but somewhat of an experience of being stricken in the heart, when you meet somebody and you're trying to help them, you can talk about being stricken in the heart, and it'll have substance, it'll have meaning, it'll have depth. And you start there and then start building the bridge and start building the path towards solving the problem. Identification. Part of identification is proper word choice. Jesus said to his disciples one day, Today, I'm going to teach you how to fish. What an important choice of words. Fish. Who is he talking to? Fisherman. We call that brilliant. He didn't say, I'm going to teach you how to recruit. No, what do they know from recruit? These fishermen don't know recruit. And if you keep insisting on saying recruit to fishermen, we call you naive. You've got to change your vocabulary. He said, I now wish to teach you how to become fishermen. Now, see, they understood that language. He said, winning people is a lot like fishing. Now, see, they understood that story. If it's like fishing, we can figure it out here. Here's the next clue to identification. Beware of using inside lingo in the outside world. Sometimes inside some little catchy phrases become comfortable, but outside, they become strange. You've got to learn to shift gears into an appropriate word choice depending on your audience. It's called the gift of language, an awareness to learn how to choose the right words and the right phrases depending on who you're talking to. We call this awareness. We call this being non-lazy. We call this being sharp in perception, to know who you're talking to and how to choose the words that'll make sense. Identification. You've got to identify with the sorrow by recalling your own sorrow. Identify with the joy by recalling your own joy. Identify with the difficulty by rehearsing your own difficulty. Here's one of the best clues in learning to better identify. Go back over your own life and make a study of your own life, your circumstances, your feelings, your awareness, some of the stories you haven't told for a long time, some of the experiences you've had. Sometimes, when you freshly come from an experience, it isn't that easy to translate it, and it isn't that easy to talk about it. But as the time passes and you can take a more thoughtful approach to your experiences, the key is not to lose the intensity of it, but to become more educated in using the intensity of your experiences to weave into the next conversation. And by the gift of language and emotion, touch somebody's life, reach somebody, affect somebody, persuade somebody. How do you identify with a child? It's tough. What if the adult is 40 and the child is 12? We call that a long bridge. How do you bridge the gap between 40 and 12? It isn't easy. In fact, we used to call it the generation gap. And how do you manage the skills that build the bridge over the generation gap? Well, there's some answers here. Here's number one. Remember when you were 12, you just got to have the skill to go back. You just got to go back and relive that and let it smite you one more time. Let it hit you and let it hurt you because, see, to really affect people, you've got to be moved and you've got to be touched. And without moving and touching of life experiences, whatever emotion it calls for, there are some people you can't reach. Here's another key way to reach the kids. Read all their books. Here's what it's called. Do your homework. Lack of homework shows in the marketplace. Lack of homework shows at home. See, if a child has read this book and I read the book, one of the great places we can meet is in the book. I say to the child, remember the story? Right away, they're going to be impressed that I've done my homework. And the kids say, did you read that book? I said, yes, I read all those books. They say, wow. I say, remember the story where? They say, I remember that story. I say, well, that's about like now. Not exactly, but it's pretty close. And the child says, oh, I see, I see. Now, they can see because we went back to the common theme that was in the book. But if you miss the book and don't do your homework, I'm telling you, you'll miss a chance to identify. Here's the big challenge. Identifying with somebody who's not like you in color or religion or circumstance. How does the successful reach and touch somebody who isn't successful? 
Well, first of all, they've got to talk about their struggle, not their success. Let me give you the clue to good identification. Your struggle will more often identify than your success. If you've got an hour to talk and you spend 59 minutes on your success story, we call that building a gulf, not a bridge. You've got to spend most of the time on your struggle, most of the time on your fears, most of the time on your apprehensions, most of the time you hesitated, most of the time you're about to give it up. You've got to spend some time on that. That's called identification and people can't wait to hear about your struggle. They can't wait to hear about your fears. Now, we call that the common denominator of life. Everybody knows what fear is. Everybody knows what sorrow is. Everybody knows what apprehension is. Everybody knows what difficulty is. Everybody knows what it's like to be pushed against the wall. Those are the common denominators. You've got to take your experiences and translate them into the common denominator of life so that somebody identifies and says, me too, I've been there too. Now, you've got a chance to affect somebody's life. Now, here's the last part of a good presentation, and that's humor. Sometimes when you get through, all you can do is laugh. So, humor is a very important part of a presentation. Let me give you some of the best thoughts I've got on humor. Start laughing with them. One of the best ways to be humorous is to laugh at yourself. Everybody likes a person who can laugh at themselves. Don't get too serious about yourself. Be serious about the message, but don't get too serious about yourself. Learn to laugh at yourself. Here's another clue to good humor. Don't start with the humor. Start with the message. This is very important. Sometimes, if you start with the humor, you won't get to the message. But if you start with the message, then you'll enjoy the humor better, and the humor will help you remember the message. We call that a good one-two punch. Now, here's the next clue to good humor. Use good taste. No off-color stuff. No slang. Use good taste. Here's another clue to good humor. Humor has to be part of you. It has to be something you do, not something you say. You can't use humor effectively if you haven't experienced it. Now, here's the best advice I've got on humor. Be yourself. If you're not a humorist, don't try to be. Just be yourself. You don't need to put on an act to be humorous. Just be yourself. If you're a little funny, fine. If you're not, fine. Just be yourself. Now, here's the most important thought on communication. If you want to affect, if you want to reach, if you want to persuade, if you want to change somebody's life, remember the key word in communication, sincerity. Sincerity. If you can fake that, you got it made. Now, that's supposed to be a little humor. But here's the key to communication. Don't fake it. Be real. Be sincere. Sincerity is the key to affecting people's lives, to changing people's lives, to persuading people, to being able to say it well. You've got to be sincere. So, let me give you a summary here. Here's the key to saying it well. Learn to say it well. Here's how to learn to say it well. Practice. Here's what to practice. Practice how to choose the right words, how to choose the right emotions, how to use the right intensity, how to get a good style, how to read your audience, how to use logic and reason effectively, how to identify with your audience, and how to be humorous. These are the skills that will help you say it well. Now, here's the big challenge. You've got to keep on practicing because if you don't use it, you lose it. You've got to make sure that every chance you get, you're using your skills, and you're getting better, and you're improving, and you're growing, and you're developing. Then, when the time comes, you can say it well. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this pivotal moment where the fabric of your destiny awaits transformation. Today, we delve into the profound power of the mind, the catalyst that shapes your reality and propels you towards your dreams. Let me ask you this. What sets apart the achievers from the dreamers, the champions from the spectators? It's the unwavering commitment to a mindset that believes in the potency of goals. Goals are the compass that steers the direction of our lives. They are not merely wishes or whims. They are the roadmap to our aspirations, the beacon that illuminates the path to success. Think about it for a moment. What is your life's grand design? Do you have a crystal clear vision of what you wish to achieve, or do you wander through life like a ship without a rudder, 
tossed about by the winds of fate? I challenge you today to make a paradigm shift in your thinking, to embrace the transformative power of goal setting. Set your sights on the summit of your desires and craft a blueprint that will guide your every action. Understand this fundamental truth. Your current circumstances do not define your future. Your mindset and the goals you set will determine the trajectory of your life. Now, let's journey into the realm of goals. A goal is not a mere wish cast into the ether. It is a destination with a roadmap. It's not just a fantasy. It's a concrete vision that fuels your passion and ignites the fire within. When you set a goal, you breathe life into your dreams. You infuse them with purpose, direction, and clarity. The key to effective goal setting lies not just in envisioning the end result, but in breaking down that vision into tangible, actionable steps. Remember, a goal without a plan is merely a wish. Define your goals with precision and detail. Make them specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound, the SMART criteria. This is the compass that will steer your ship toward the shores of triumph. Do not be afraid to dream audaciously. Your goals should stretch you, challenge you, and push you beyond your comfort zone. Furthermore, it's not just about the destination, it's about the journey itself. Embrace the growth, the learning, and the evolution that come with pursuing your goals. Every setback, Every obstacle is an opportunity for refinement, for honing your character, and fortifying your determination. Let me share with you the power of the compound effect. Consistent, disciplined action towards your goals, no matter how small, compounds over time, leading to monumental results. Like drops of water that eventually carve through solid rock. Your consistent efforts will shape your destiny. But remember, goals are not set in stone. They are meant to be reviewed, adjusted, and refined as you progress. Adaptability is key. Life is dynamic, and so must be your approach towards your goals. Be flexible in your strategies while unwavering in your commitment to the ultimate destination. Now, let's address a critical aspect often overlooked in the pursuit of goals. The power of the mind. Your mindset is the bedrock upon which your goals are built. A positive, resilient mindset is the fuel that propels you forward in the face of adversity. Believe in the possibility of your dreams. Cultivate a mindset that welcomes challenges as opportunities for growth. Reframe failures as stepping stones toward success. As I often say, don't wish it were easier, wish you were better. Embrace the challenges, for they are the crucible in which your character is forged. Surround yourself with positivity. Your environment, the books you read, the people you associate with, they all shape your mindset. Choose wisely. Feed your mind with knowledge, wisdom, and inspiration. Aspire to learn continuously, for a mind that is open to learning is a mind that is receptive to success. Moreover, practice the art of visualization. Envision your goals with such vivid clarity that they become an inseparable part of your reality. Be yourself already in possession of your desires. Feel the emotions. Immerse yourself in that future reality. This visualization technique is a powerful tool that aligns your subconscious mind with your conscious goals. Which leads me to my next point. What is the price you will pay if you do not develop this mindset shift? Let me paint you a vivid picture. Imagine waking up every day, going through the motions of life like a ship without a captain. Tossed aimlessly by the unpredictable waves of circumstance. You see, without a clear destination in mind, without a compass pointing you towards your dreams, 
You become a wanderer in the vast sea of existence. You may ask, what's the price one pays for not embracing the concept of transforming your life through goals? Well, let me tell you, it's a heavy toll indeed. It's the cost of settling for less than you're capable of. It's forfeiting your potential, surrendering your dreams at the altar of comfort and complacency. When you neglect the power of a mindset shift fueled by purposeful goals, you consign yourself to a life dictated by happenstance. You become a spectator in your own life story, watching opportunities pass by like fleeting clouds in the sky. It's living a life filled with regrets and what-ifs, haunted by the ghosts of unfulfilled aspirations. Imagine reaching the twilight of your life, looking back at the years gone by, and realizing that you've traded the pursuit of your passions for a life of monotony. You may have had the talent, the potential, the opportunity, yet you chose to coast along the path of least resistance. The price of not setting and pursuing goals is the agony of unfulfilled potential and the sorrow of regret. But here's the silver lining. The beauty of life lies in your ability to pivot, to make a conscious choice to transform your future starting today. Embracing a mindset shift and understanding the power of setting compelling goals can rewrite the script of your life. Imagine waking up every morning with a sense of purpose coursing through your veins. Your goals become the lighthouse guiding your ship through the stormy waters of life. Each goal achieved becomes a milestone, a testament to your determination and resilience. It's about taking charge of your destiny and sculpting your future according to your dreams. When you cultivate the habit of setting and pursuing meaningful goals, you infuse your life with vitality, passion, and a relentless pursuit of excellence. You no longer merely exist, you thrive. You become the architect of your fate, the master of your destiny. The price you pay for not developing this mindset shift is too steep. It's sacrificing your potential, relinquishing your dreams, and settling for a life that falls short of your capabilities. But the rewards of embracing this transformational shift are immeasurable. The fulfillment of your aspirations, the joy of meaningful progress, and the legacy of a life lived with purpose. So, I implore you, don't allow life to happen to you. Make life happen for you. Commit to this mindset shift, set audacious goals, and relentlessly pursue them. Your future self will thank you for the investment you make today in the transformation of your life through the power of goals. Let me break this down further. Firstly, let me emphasize that the power of setting goals lies not just in the act itself but in the clarity and specificity of those goals. Think about it. Would you board a ship without a destination in mind? Of course not. Setting clear, well-defined goals is akin to charting your course. Dot, it gives you direction, purpose, and a destination to strive for. Financial independence is not merely a stroke of luck or an accident. It's a deliberate, conscious decision rooted in the art of setting meaningful goals. When you set financial goals, you're essentially creating a roadmap that guides your actions, decisions, and efforts towards achieving financial freedom. One of the key principles I always advocate is the concept of the magic of written goals. When you write down your goals, something incredible happens. They become tangible, they become real. Thoughts floating around in your mind can easily be forgotten or diluted by the countless distractions of life. However, when you ink your aspirations onto paper, you crystallize them into existence. You give yourself something to hold onto, to visualize, and to work relentlessly towards. 
But setting goals isn't just about putting pen to paper. It's about crafting smart goals. Specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Let me break it down for you. Specific. Your goals must be clear and precise. Vague aspirations won't cut it. Define exactly what you want to achieve financially. Whether it's a specific amount of savings, a targeted income, or an investment milestone. Be crystal clear about it. Measurable. Make sure your goals are quantifiable. How will you measure your progress? Set benchmarks and metrics to track your journey towards your financial objectives. Achievable. Your goals should be within the realm of possibility. Dream big, yes, but also ensure that your goals are realistically attainable. Stretch yourself, but don't set yourself up for failure. Relevant. Your financial goals should align with your overall life vision. They should resonate with your values, aspirations, and long-term objectives. Ask yourself, why is this goal important to me? How does it contribute to my greater purpose? Time bound. Set deadlines. Without a time frame, a goal becomes a wish. Create a sense of urgency by establishing deadlines that push you to take action. Remember, time is a precious resource. Use it wisely. Now, let's delve into how setting these SMART goals directly correlates with achieving financial independence. When you set specific financial goals, you're essentially programming your subconscious mind to seek opportunities that align with those goals. You start noticing possibilities, connections, and avenues that were previously invisible to you. Your mind becomes a magnet, attracting resources, ideas, and strategies that propel you towards your financial aspirations. Moreover, setting measurable goals allows you to track your progress. It's like having a GPS on your journey to financial freedom. You can see how far you've come, analyze what's working, and make necessary adjustments along the way. This tracking mechanism empowers you to stay focused and motivated, even when faced with challenges or setbacks. The achievable aspect of SMART goals ensures that you set realistic targets. It's essential to dream big, but it's equally crucial to break those dreams into manageable steps. By setting achievable goals, you maintain a sense of belief and momentum, fueling your determination to keep moving forward. Now, let's not overlook the relevance of your financial goals. When your goals are aligned with your values and aspirations, they become a source of inspiration. They give you a reason to wake up early, stay up late, and push beyond your limits. They infuse your actions with passion and purpose, making the pursuit of financial independence not just a destination but a fulfilling journey. Lastly, the time-bound nature of SMART goals instills a sense of urgency. It prevents procrastination and excuses, urging you to take consistent action. Time becomes your ally, urging you to make the most of every moment towards your financial aspirations. Now, to the best part of all, let's talk about your transformation. Understand this. The mind is the most incredible tool you possess. It's capable of crafting visions, shaping destinies, and altering the course of your life. But often, it's not about the mind's potential. It's about how you utilize it. It's about understanding the magic that happens when you set sail on the vast sea of goals. Imagine for a moment a life without direction, devoid of purpose a ship sailing without a destination. Without clear goals, life becomes a series of aimless wanderings, lacking the fuel that propels you toward your aspirations. Goals are the compasses that guide us through the uncharted territories of life. 
They give us direction, purpose, and clarity amidst the chaos. The transformation that unfolds when you embrace the art of setting goals is nothing short of miraculous. It's a journey that takes you from a life of uncertainty to one of purpose, from mediocrity to excellence, from mere existence to a life of significance. So, I implore you, embrace this transformation. Seize the power that lies within your grasp. Set goals that excite your soul, that challenge your limits, and that beckon you toward a life of abundance. For in this journey of setting and achieving goals, you'll not only transform your life, you'll redefine the very essence of who you are. Remember, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams and have the audacity to set sail toward them. Start today and witness the miraculous transformation that unfolds when you shift your mindset and embark on the extraordinary journey of setting goals. Thank you.